But what about the Israeli hostages still in Gaza? Amid the escalating tensions between Israel and Iran, Hamas has proposed a new ceasefire deal with Israel. After rejecting last week's US-mediated truce deal, Hamas has demanded permanent ceasefire in Gaza. Handing its new proposal to mediators in Egypt and Qatar, Hamas has said that any agreement must end Israel's war in Gaza. Here's what they propose, a three-phase process. The first phase would require Israel to end the war. No hostages would be freed in those first six weeks. They would be freed over the second and third phases, with each phase lasting six weeks. In exchange, Israel will have to free Palestinians who are in prison. This is what Hamas wants for peace to return, and their demands far more than those put forward by the U.S. coordinated mediators last week. And it does not even end there. Hamas has demanded that in the initial phase of this potential truce deal, it would see displaced Palestinians return unimpeded to northern Gaza. It would require Israeli soldiers, the IDF, to also withdraw from all urban centers in Gaza. So what happens to the Israeli hostages is the question that remains. Does Hamas have all the Israeli hostages? Because until last week, Hamas told the truth mediators that it is currently not able to identify and locate them. And if that's true, where are they? Hamas claims that it would use the initial six-week phase of this potential truce deal to locate all the hostages and ascertain their condition. They are believed to be still holding 129 of the 253 hostages that were abducted on the 7th of October. There are doubts about how many of the remaining hostages are even alive. And under its new proposal, Hamas would release elderly and sick hostages. Women and female soldiers would be released in the second phase. Meanwhile, Hamas is demanding the release of 30 Palestinian security prisoners for each civilian Israeli hostage released. This is a tenfold increase from the three security prisoners who were freed from each civilian hostage in the last deal in November 2023. Many of the demands laid out by Hamas in its previous proposals have been, have rejected, have been rejected by Israel as non-starters. For Israel, a permanent ceasefire and the withdrawal of Israeli troops from the entire Gaza Strip is not on the cards. Israel has said, in fact, it intends to resume the war once any hostage deal is carried out. Remember, Israel's two prime war goals are declared. Number one, securing the freedom of all hostages. Number two, destroying Hamas's military and governance capabilities in Gaza. Will Hamas's new proposal put the ceasefire talks in more jeopardy? We will have to wait and watch. And joining me at this point on the broadcast to get us the latest from on the ground is our correspondent Jodi Cohen. Uh, she was in Tel Aviv all of today talking to the families of the hostages. Jodi, uh, Jodi, thanks very much for being here. Where do you think these rising tensions really leave the hostage crisis? Hi, Molly. So if you mean in terms of rising tensions, the hostage negotiations, Hamas has rejected the latest proposal for a temporary ceasefire and return of 40 of the 133 hostages. Hamas, as you said, they've reiterated for the third time, perhaps, some of their initial demands, um, which Israel has called delusional. But negotiations at this stage are expected to continue. We haven't heard otherwise. But if you mean by rising tensions, Iran's attack on Saturday night, in which it fired 320 projectiles towards Israel, then the focus of the Israeli government has certainly turned to that and the question of how Israel would respond. Now, David Mensah, Israeli government spokesperson, gave a statement on Monday, and he said that Iran runs Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis and militias in Iraq, and that Iran orchestrated Hamas's 7th of October massacre of Israelis. A Saudi official has reportedly told Israeli media that the Saudis also believe that Iran was behind Hamas's attack and the taking of hostages. So this suggests potentially that Israel might see putting pressure on Iran as a way to put pressure on Hamas to release the hostages. Uh, right. Uh, so, Jody, is there really a plan to bring the hostages home? Uh, what more can you tell us about the 
efforts that are being made at this point? What is your assessment? And you were talking to those families uh, all day. Uh, tell us more about what they told you. Right, so in Hostages Square, it's an opportunity for people to meet with the families or friends of some of the hostages. I've been going there over the past six months. I was there again today, and the feeling is very much that time is running out for the hostages who've been in Gaza for 192 days now. Um, they were saying, most of them, that the hostages need to be the government's top priority. As far as I can see, there are four strategies that the Israeli government could take to get the hostages home. There's the hostage negotiations, there's pressure on Iran, pressure on Hamas, or perhaps a rescue operation, which would be difficult with Hamas's tunnels and the battalions left in Rafa. We don't know what was discussed in Sunday's war cabinet meeting, but if you look at Mensah's statement, he said that even under attack from Iran, Israel has not lost sight of the goals, which as you said, are to rescue the hostages and destroy Hamas. Um, that includes, he said, targeting the last four Hamas battalions in Rafa. And he said this before highlighting that Hamas had rejected the latest deal proposal. The government has said repeatedly that it believes that military pressure is what will lead Hamas ultimately to agree to a reasonable deal. They said that's what happened last time. Um, but reports in the Israeli media are suggesting perhaps that Israel might have delayed an operation in Rafa. This has been denied by the Prime Minister's Likud party and it remains to be seen what Israel's next move will be. Indeed, we're leaving it there for the moment, Jody. Thanks very much for joining us with those updates. Thank you. I realize it's a rather grim Monday from stories of war, death and destruction to tensions on the rise that could lead to a war. In times like these, it becomes all the more important for us to look out for stories of hope. You know, for stories that reinstill our faith in humanity. And I am proud to share with you one such story from India. People of the southern Indian state of Kerala have set a remarkable example of solidarity and compassion. Together, they have saved a man's life. In fact, a complete stranger's life. A man who had nothing to do with them except for sharing roots, being from the same state. Let me tell you the story of Abdul Rahim. He hails from Kohikor in Kerala and used to work as an auto rickshaw driver. He has spent the last 18 years of his life be being behind bars. That too on foreign soil in Saudi Arabia. What did he do? What was his crime? He allegedly killed a Saudi boy back in 2006. The boy was specially abled. He used to breathe and eat using the help of a device attached to his body. And Rahim was asked to take care of him along with other driving duties. But the boy passed away on Rahim's watch. This is what had happened. One day when Rahim was driving, the boy assaulted him for stopping at a traffic signal. Rahim tried to calm down the teenager and protect himself. But he ended up pushing the medical device on the boy's shoulder as for reports. The device fell inside the car. The boy became unconscious and ultimately died. That's according to several media reports. Because of all this, Rahim was put into prison, but the worst had not happened yet. In 2018, Rahim was sentenced to death. This was after the family of the Saudi boy refused to grant amnesty. Rahim appealed for mercy from the top courts, but he was only met with rejection and disappointment. However, in 2023, Rahim received a ray of hope. Finally, the deceased's family agreed to pardon him, but only if he paid the blood money. And it was not a small sum. They demanded 15 million Saudi rials. That's almost 34 crore rupees. And the demand came with a ticking clock. The deal was signed on the 16th of October 2023, and it was supposed to be fulfilled within six months. That is by the 16th of April 2024. How would Rahim manage that? Until a week ago, it seemed nearly impossible. The action committee, which was formed to work for the release of Rahim, could manage only a meager amount, that's about 5 crore rupees, barely 15% of the required amount. 
the deadline was fast approaching. Abdul Rahim's fate was on the line. He desperately needed help. And the people of Kerala united to do just that. Not only those living in India, but from across the world. More than 75 organizations in Riyadh, a Kerala-based businessman, Bobby Chemanur, various political organizations in the state and the common people all came together to raise the required funds. The campaign significantly intensified in the past few days, in fact. Chemuru organized multiple events. He also organized the sale of one of his products and donated the entire amount to the cause. The Action Committee also created a mobile application to ensure transparency in the matter. And before they knew it, they, were managed, to they managed to collect 34 crore rupees. On Friday, the representatives of the committee held a press conference and declared that they finally managed to find the required sum. And when asked about it, Rahim's mother said she never thought they would be able to collect such a huge sum, but it was made possible by sheer kindness and goodwill. All these people who had never even met Rahim, did not even know him personally, contributed their hard-earned money to bring him back home. Is China running sleeper cells in the Philippines? What makes me ask that question? An ad posted on Facebook, it had called for part-time military consultants from the Philippines. And the Philippines believes the ad is linked to a covert Chinese organization. And this has raised alarm. The armed forces of the Philippines are considering this to be a national security concern. It has announced an investigation into the matter now. Our next report, getting you the complete story. Is China openly hiring spies in the Philippines? Is Beijing operating covert sleeper cells? The armed forces of the Philippines believe so. In the latest, an online advertisement posted on Facebook has sparked a row. The ad had called for part-time military consultants from the Philippines. So, who was eligible to apply? Anyone with at least a year of experience working within the armed forces or government departments in the Philippines. What were the applicants expected to do? Write a weekly report on military subjects of topical interest. But the Philippines claims it is just a farce. According to military intelligence reports, the recruiter was looking for Filipinos with military backgrounds to conduct espionage activities in West Philippine Sea. They're also trying to plant operatives in sleeper cells throughout the country. Meanwhile, Philippine Military Chief General Romeo Brona has also said that military officers are being approached to help China's territorial claims in the South China Sea. The advertisement has now been taken down. In fact, the entire recruitment site has now been deactivated. The Filipino military and other government agencies are tracking those behind the Facebook account. They are also checking for any leaked sensitive information. The Armed Forces of the Philippines has called this a national security concern. It has launched an investigation into the matter. The Philippines suspects that the recruitment ad was posted by a Chinese organization. These claims are yet to be verified. China, meanwhile, has denied any wrongdoing. It has dismissed the Filipino claims as malicious speculation and fabrication. The sleeper cell allegations, however, have only intensified, especially after a Philippine senator questioned the Philippine Retirement Authority. You see, the state-owned corporation issues special resident retiree visas to Chinese nationals of soldiers' age. According to government data, some 78,000 foreign retirees hold special resident visas in the Philippines. Chinese nationals account for 30,000 of them. This only adds to the Philippines' concerns over Chinese espionage. Who knows what these Chinese nationals are actually doing on Filipino soil? Especially at a time when tensions are running high between the two nations in the South China Sea.
Filipino and Chinese vessels have had repeated confrontations close to 2nd Thomas Shaw. Just last week, the Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. held a trilateral meeting with US President Joe Biden and Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida. The three denounced China's dangerous and aggressive behavior of its absurd claims on most of the South China Sea. Later this month, the US and the Philippines will conduct its annual Bali Katan joint military exercises involving some 11,000 American troops and 5,000 Filipino soldiers in the region. How is the dragon going to react to all of this? Needless to say, the tensions are only expected to increase. The escalating tensions in West Asia are resulting in ripple effects far beyond the region. As I speak, diplomats in India are in touch with diplomats in Iran to secure the release of the 17 Indian crew members who were on board the ship that was seized by the Iranian forces on Saturday. On Monday, the Foreign Ministry of Iran said that Indian government officials will be allowed to meet the 17 Indian crew members on board the Israel-linked cargo ship. The assurance from Tehran came after Indian Foreign Affairs Minister Dr. S. Jay Shankar dialed his Iranian counterpart, expressing concern over the crew's conditions. In a post on the platform X, formerly Twitter, Dr. S. Jay Shankar said, and I'm quoting, spoke to the Iranian minister, this evening took up the release of 17 Indian crew members of MSC Aries, discussed the current situation in the region, stressed the importance of avoiding escalation, exercising restraint and returning to diplomacy. And following the talks with the Indian minister, Iran's minister saying that they are following up on the details related to the ship, he assured that the representatives of the Indian government will soon be allowed to meet with the crew. Iran also, in fact, called for India's continued role through international institutions, including the UN Security Council, to stop the war in Gaza, which it said is the root of the current crisis in the region. The ship with the Indians on board was seized on Saturday. Video shared by news agency Reuters showed members of the Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps rappelling down from what looks like a Soviet-era helicopter onto the Portuguese flagged cargo ship. Both the Iranian Revolutionary Guards and the Iranian-backed Yemeni group, the Houthis, have used this type of helicopter before to raid the ships transiting the Red Sea. Hey, things up, don't come out. Hey, things up. The name of this particular ship is MSC Aries, and the IRGC seized it near the Strait of Hormuz. According to state run IRNA news agency, it was taken into Iranian territorial waters. Iran's seizure of the ship followed a sus suspected Israeli strike on the Iranian consulate in Syri Syria's Damascus. The suspected Israeli attack had killed 12 people, including a top Iranian general. Iran, remember, had vowed to avenge, avenge the strike, and it did that on Saturday by launching hundreds of missiles and drones at Israel. The ship is associated with London-based Zodiac Maritime. It is, in fact, part of Israeli billionaire Eyal Affairs Zodiac Group. Geneva-based MSC has acknowledged the seizure, saying that a total of 25 crew members were on board the vessel. 17 of them are Indians. The seizure also comes after the naval head of Iran's Revolutionary Guards, Alireza Tangsiri, warned last week of closing the Strait of Hormuz, if it deemed necessary. According to Indian media reports, officials in New Delhi are in touch with Tehran for the security, welfare and early release of the Indians. Recently, New Delhi had even issued a travel advisory asking Indians to not travel, remember, to Iran and Israel due to the prevailing situation in the region. <laughs> 